everyone. Welcome back to Writer's Book Club podcast. This, for those of you who don't know, is a writing podcast where we take a deep dive with an author into the writing craft and process behind one of their books. And this month I had the absolute pleasure of speaking with the very talented Hannah Kent about her most recent novel, Devotion. If you've been on my social media, you know I've been gushing about this book for a while. Hannah's writing is always known for its lyricism and her prose has been described as transcendental, but Hannah's novels are also page turners. So I was really keen to talk to her about how she blends her love of language and landscape with things like pacing and tension, which you want in a book. She went into some detail about that, so have a listen. Before we begin, I want to tell you a little bit about Hannah Kent. Her first novel was the international bestseller Burial Rights, which was translated into a whopping 30 languages or more, I think, and won the ABIA Literary Fiction Book of the Year, among many other awards and shortlistings all over the world. It was just everywhere when it came out. Her second novel, The Good People, was also widely acclaimed, and I've got absolutely no doubt that her third novel, the one we're discussing today, Devotion, will be equally lauded, awarded, shortlisted, and all the other things. Hannah co-founded the Australian literary publication Kill Your Darlings, which is such a great name, I've always loved the name of that magazine, and has written for numerous publications both here and overseas. Hannah has also written, wait for it, a screenplay for a feature film. It's called Run Rabbit Run and it will be released a little bit later this year. It's directed by Dana Reed of Handmaid's Tale fame and stars the Australian actress who's doing very well in Hollywood, Sarah Snook. It's so exciting and really just confirms there are no ends to Hannah's writing talents. Please enjoy this writing chat with the absolutely delightful Hannah Kent. Hannah, thank you so much for coming on and welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. I adored this novel. Uh, I read it over the summer when I was up in Byron Bay and it was pouring with rain and um, inhaled it over two days. What did you do to me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. First and foremost, thank you for reading it. I'm so glad that, you know, you didn't, it wasn't extended out over a period of weeks and you had to trudge through it. That's the last thing an author wants to hear. So thank you. Well, actually, I, that's something I did want to talk to you was about pacing because I found I couldn't put it down. I've heard of this term literary page turner and I think <laughs> I found it in devotion. Um, I wanted to start by asking you about the seeds for this novel. Where did this idea come from? That's a very good question. With my previous two novels, um, the, you know, their origin story is very clear cut. Uh, I, with burial rites and with the good people, it was a matter of stumbling across true events from the historical past that utterly captivated me and also made me, you know, I, they filled me with curiosity. And some, in, to some degree, these, these events and the people who were involved in them haunted me for years before I decided, okay, I need to try and, you know, work out why I'm so interested in this, what is there to uncover, and then I would then go on and write a book about it. Devotion began in a far more nebulous sort of manner. I knew that I was perhaps ready to write about Australia. I think that was probably one of the first things. I love writing about landscape. It's one of the one of the reasons why I write, um, because I enjoy the process of, of writing about nature so much. And I had found my mind preoccupied with the landscapes of Paramount Country, which is specifically the Barossa region in South Australia and also the Adelaide Hills where I live um, and where I grew up. And I was asking myself very sort of non-committal questions like, is this something that, am I ready now to write about a place which is actually so familiar to me, as opposed to my previous novels, where one set in Iceland, one set in Ireland, I felt that I could draw upon my experience of being an outsider to ask questions that perhaps had not been asked before. You know, it was my lack of familiarity with those places that I felt enabled me to write about them. And so I was wondering, am I going to be able to write a novel ever set in Australia, specifically this landscape? But at the same time, I was so, I was finding myself going for lots of walks and really noticing the place, asking a lot of questions about the history of this place, of the Paramount people, um, whose country it is, and I thought, well, maybe, maybe this fascination and this renewed interest is is something to go by. You know, Charlotte Wood has written this beautiful book called The Luminous Solution, 
uh, which you might be familiar with, as, as your listeners may be too. And in it, she talks about heat seeking. And I think that that's a really lovely way to describe that kind of early process where you're just trying to sort of put hands out and find, you know, the little things that are interesting. Or To me, I, I sometimes feel like it's not to mysticize the process, but it's like having little visions or little intuitive pulls. And I felt myself being pulled towards writing about the landscape of Australia. So I thought, okay, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can start to research some of the historical events that occurred in this place um, and to see whether whether there's anything there, whether the heat remains and gets hotter or whether it goes cold, whether I continue to have these visions and ideas, whether it all gels together or whether it falls to pieces. And so Alongside this, I was also ready to write about something that was not necessarily, uh, how can we put it, <laughs> without sounding like I'm paying out my own work, not so grim. You know, Burial Rights was about the execution of the last execution in Iceland uh, in, in the 1830s there. The good people similarly took very grim, bleak, uh, you know, quite melancholic events. And I felt ready after sort of spending six years immersed in those worlds to step into a not, not lighter than, um, you know, superficial, but lighter than more sort of celebratory tone. So I was thinking, okay, here I am interested in these landscapes. Here I am wanting to celebrate something. And I thought, as soon as I sort of realised these things, I thought intuitively of the, the historical background of Prussian immigrants fleeing persecution in, in Prussia and making German, essentially Germanic settlements here in the Adelaide Hills. I'm related to some of these Prussian, Prussian immigrants. I'm very familiar with the story. And at the time, I'd just come back from Melbourne where I was living and no one really seemed to know about this sort of the, the importance of German culture and Prussian culture to South Australia in terms of our colonial history. So I started thinking, okay, that's interesting. Maybe I can explore that. Because alongside these sort of musings about what I could write about was also a very real reluctance to even write about colonial Australian colonial history because I knew I was never going to occupy the perspective of an Indigenous First Nations um, person so the alternative was to inhabit the perspective or the characters of white colonialists and that had very little interest for me because to a certain degree when you're writing historical fiction you have to honour the perspectives and the biases and the, the worldview of your characters. So alongside these thoughts of the landscape and these sort of German settlers, I was thinking, okay, is this something that I can do? And then what really cemented the whole, the whole idea and sort of all these disparate visions and these disparate sort of heat-seeking moments, these little <laughs> things that were interesting me, um, it was 2017 and we had the uh, same-sex plebiscite. And I, at that time, I was interested in the German women, particularly. I was thinking, can I write a story which is sort of about the friendship between them? You know, that's celebratory. It's interesting. I wanted to really explore the food cultures which have survived from this past. And then when we had the same-sex vote, or well, same-sex marriage vote, you know, I, it was a very personal time for me. Um, I had a girlfriend at the time. She's now my wife. She proposed to me when the vote came through. And I sort of had this... I don't know, it's sort of a, I was so angry, you know, that I sort of started thinking about what I could do about my anger and how I could answer back some of the hatred and vitriol which came our way during that whole process. And I thought, you know, kind of bugger it. <laughs> bugger a book on friendship. I want to write a love story. And as soon as I decided that I would write a love story between two women you know, set in Paramount country, you know, amongst these religious Prussian communities, even though all these various elements felt so unlikely, that was when, you know, I heard the first sort of beats of what would be the heartbeat of the novel. That's when I knew I had something alive. And that's when the writing process began. But so, yes, after a long, long time of really thinking about all these very sort of seemingly strange and dislocated elements that I was interested in, as soon as I realised I wanted to write a love story and I wanted to celebrate queer love and write about it in a way that was joyous and uplifting, um, that was when I thought, okay, this is the book. This is the one that I'm writing. But, yeah, it took it was a very different process of arriving at this novel than with my previous two. Um, even though I'd already decided to write a, a love story between two women in essentially a very religious immigrating community, you know, and within a congregation settling in, you know, 19th century Australia, 
Um, and this was what I was probably, even without being aware of, kind of flirting with the idea of having the significant friendship between two women. Yeah. You know, it probably would have been romantic even if the characters had not been aware of it. But it was yeah. my decision to make both characters completely aware of the nature of their mm. feelings, even if it, perhaps at the beginning they lacked a vocabulary to speak to it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it was um, it totally, totally that was part of the draw card, um, was knowing that we had this kind of history that has been undocumented, that has been rendered mm. invisible, and it was very much a desire to add to representation because representation is just another form of, you know, it's incredibly validating um, and it's it's necessary. We need to kind of, I, I guess I saw myself as building or creating a fictionalised history in lieu of receiving a real one. So I was, of course, hoping somehow by some miracle that I would stumble across a real life love story. Of course, I didn't. But research still formed a very big part of my early writing process. I love that your the proposal, your, your marriage proposal from your girlfriend from Heidi came on the day of the same sex plebiscite. Yeah, so yeah. she's obviously sitting on it for a while, just wondering <laughs> what was going to happen. I mean, we'd already spoken about marriage, but it yeah. was a lovely, it was a lovely moment, and you know, made the day even more significant for us. Absolutely, because I was, I was also pregnant at the time, and so even from like a legal perspective, being married is just so for us was hugely important in terms of legitimising our relationship and our families. So yeah, yeah, really special day. I remember going up to the letterbox with my daughter, who you just met earlier. She was seven at the time, and we took great joy in ticking the yes, and then we walked up to the post box, and it's more meaningful now that I know somebody that was actually proposed to on that same day. So that's oh, just yeah. a beautiful, what a beautiful thing. I'm sure there were many proposals that day. <laughs> <laughs> It must have been a really joyful day for so many. No wonder we all felt so happy that day. So can you take us through the process of writing devotion? How did that process of taking all these different seemingly disparate ideas and putting them on the page start for you? And what was your writing practice throughout? Again, it was quite different with my previous novels, probably more than any other reason due to the fact that I was pregnant twice and had very young children throughout the process, um, which is also why it took me a little bit longer. I think, though, you know, I'm not someone who's a, a plotter. I, I really envy writers who have the ability to sit down and map out a novel and sort of provide themselves with a guidebook as to how to write it. I'm very much a sort of flying by the seat of pants, fumbling in the dark, just trying to, you know, working out what I'm even doing by writing. So I need to write to work out what it is that I'm going to write. So when I was interested in these various things like the landscape or possibly, you know, originally, you know, friendship, I was writing my way into these ideas. Basically, again, that was how I was working out if there was any, anything substantial there, if there was something that I could continue with. Because sometimes you write something and it's flat and it's already dead on the page and you get a sort of a, a gut sense that it's not going to go anywhere. So I wrote a lot of material originally right at the beginning of this book, knowing that it wasn't going to be in the book. So for me, it was working out whether I could even, for instance, write about the Australian landscape, um, whether it was working or whether that familiarity that I was so aware with was going to sort of impede my ability to render it new on the page which is essentially what you're trying to do right mm. you're, I feel like as a writer I'm just continually trying to take things that people are already aware of and know about but make them fresh and new so that you can sort of have a have a new perspective and be engaged in that way so I was writing those sort of sections and then it, when I mentioned earlier that I decided it was going to be a love story that was the that was sort of the point where I started to write a little, with I guess a little bit more um, intent so at that stage, I, my ancient came to character. You know, who are these two people um, that, who were going to fall in love? Was I going to use a third person? Was I going to write first person? And very quickly, I decided it was going to be first person and it was going to be narrated by a woman called Hannah. And who, although at the time she didn't have that name. Um, and it was, it was her adoration of this other woman who was named Taya and that was really going to to drive the story and the narrative but my process is because I do write my way around the book and into the book I I very much rely on the 
writing and rewriting and the drafts. I, I, you know, I do so many drafts. It's just how I work. I wish I didn't have to spend so much time, but, you know, I'm yet to find another method. <laughs> so the earlier process was really just trying to find her voice and it was trying to find her character. And once I had those things, then it was a matter of, I think, just working through, I guess in quite a logical sense, the plot that would follow from the sort of person that she was and the sort of decisions that she would make. Um, but, yeah, it was very drawn out. This, the writing process, I mean, with my previous two novels, I was, um, all my work was freelance. So even though I was working other jobs, I had the luxury of working from home at my own pace, largely calling my own hours. I had a very quite strict methodology of doing all my research, stopping, and then I would write a thousand words a day. I would finish a draft, go back, write another draft, and I'd do that probably 12 times. Oh, my gosh, With Hannah. This, <laughs> it was a lot. I told you I wish I could plot it out. It would save me, me so much time. But with this book, you know, suddenly I'm breastfeeding in the middle of a chapter or I'm, you know, just working on zero sleep. And so naturally it was a very much more dislocated process. I ended up switching from Word, which is what I used to write in, to Scrivener because it sort of allowed me to write these short vignettes and little sections and move them all around. So it felt like totally chaotic when I was writing it, but it did eventually pull together. Um, but yeah, it was very much a process of just nailing character and nailing voice and then working through the plot, working through the pacing and finally sort of getting the structure down. But I mean, my first drafts basically have no structure. They're essentially just characters speaking, just me getting to know my characters. Yeah. And also with the description as well, I guess that's just also just getting that out on the page and seeing where the heat is, right? Yeah, absolutely. I remember Nikki Gemmell talking about, um, you know, she's set quite a few of her early novels in Australia, but she said she almost has to be away from the country in order to be able to see it fresh. Did you have to remove yourself a little bit and go into your mind's eye or was it more immersive, like walking in the bush and trying to see it through new eyes? It was a mix of both, I think. I guess in some ways that writers of speculative fiction or fantasy, you know, do world building. Research is the way that I build the historical world. So doing that research, I read many accounts, first, you know, primary sources, first-hand accounts of people arriving and describing the landscape. So I was able to borrow their fresh eyes to a certain degree. But also I started thinking, I found myself thinking a great deal about my childhood of, and of, you know, growing up in the hills. And I think I probably spent a lot of time remembering that sense of wonder that we feel so keenly when we're children. You know, I, I was super lucky to, to grow up in this place. I spent a lot of time outside. I was given a free reign in terms of play and imagination. And I really found myself remembering moments I had in the natural world. And I think, you know, me, me reflecting on those times really came in and started to influence the character of Hannah, particularly because there's um, sections of the first bit of the book where she's essentially, you know, on the on the cusp of becoming a woman. She's in that unsteady ground between child and woman. So, yeah, I definitely borrowed that and I borrowed the information and the perspectives from the research. But also, I, I you know, I wrote a lot of this book in lockdown. So I was out, you know, because I could go nowhere else. So I did spend a lot of time walking around. But yeah, it was um, it was a, a curious mix. Yeah. There's a section on page 275 that I think really illustrates what you're talking about. I'd love you to read it if you would. Yeah, of course. Um, the sound of this country is one long sustained note that does not end. It is a humming that holds all the other music of this place in harmony. Every other sound is threaded upon it. It was at the port that I began to curate new litanies. Between the bullock drivers that rumbled in from Adelaide, the sailors, the merchants, the English come in search of labourers, I found words given to the music I heard against the constant run of the wind amongst the rushes and sand dunes. She oak for the tree with long scaled needles, whistling the wind in a way that made my skin lift. Magpie lark for the two shriek calling peep and changing hours. Salt paper bark for the crooked trees groaning wooded, cupped fruit, mangrove, wattle, salt bush. In the months that came afterwards, I learned new words as the congregation did, as they crossed the dusty, ticking plains of Adelaide. I placed them next to one another upon the deeper vibration of this country. Galah, cockatoo, lorikeet. 
kangaroo, wallaby, possum, emu, goanna, quoll. And now, years later, sitting on the lip of this valley, I can make prayer beads of the trees that crown me, the small living things glimpsed if I am still and silent, red gum, blue gum, quanto, stringy bark, and the birds ever hear, ever singing, a liturgy to govern the hours towards gods of cry and shriek and call, kookaburra, magpie, strike thrush, wagtail, caravan, crow, boo Scripture may no longer roll off my tongue in smooth certainty, but my mouth is still full of spirit. Holy writ of living things, each one a prayer against the teeth. Oh, Hannah, that's so beautiful. I sometimes listen to magpies. We have a lot of them around here. And I've always wondered how I would write the way they sound, but you've just done it. The two shriek calling peep in changing hours. That's exactly how they are. You nailed it. <laughs> it was so much fun. I just really, I was so worried about whether or not it would be possible to write about Australia. And it was just instead a matter of just leaning into it. I love of it. It was, a, you know, it was, I mean, it felt like a gift even having me, you know, being able to try and write about it. Yeah. And I love the way Hana still embraces her religion as well as her love of nature. It's like she really seamlessly blends her upbringing, her religious upbringing with her you know, um, devotion, for want of a better word, to, <laughs> to nature and to the natural world. She doesn't ever feel like she has to separate them out, does she? No. I mean, this is, uh, it's interesting, um, Hannah's relationship to nature. For me, it was such a central, foundational part of her character. Yeah. And since the book has been published, I've referred to her, to her ability to relate to nature and to engage with it and commune with it as a kind of synesthesia. But when I was writing the book, I wasn't regarding it as that kind of, you know, uh, a synesthesia at all. It was something which was much more religious. Um, mm. So Hannah, for those of um, for those perhaps listening who haven't or who aren't familiar with the book at all, she has this ability to really hear nature and experience the natural world and the weather in a way that most of us don't. For her, she hears trees singing to her. You know, sunlight has a sound. She has this very musical ability to to relate to the outside world. And for her, this relationship, this ability to commune with the natural world gives her so much joy that it's akin to the divinity she experiences with, in, within the church, within you know, the, the services conducted by the congregation and community she lives in. Her father's a church elder. But what makes her different is that for the rest of the congregation, God and the divine is confined to those services. It's confined to what is essentially a very strict religious practice. For Hannah, it's, you know, it's sprawling. God is everywhere. So in, she has almost like a pantheistic approach too. Mm-hmm. So this was something that as soon as I hit upon, I thought, well, this is such a wonderful way to explore someone who, you know, is, is a sort of, you know, sees evidence for her faith and for her religious practice, not just in the words of the Bible or under the lectures of, you know, her elder father, but you know, in in the world, in her experience of the world. And this is also what sets her apart from her family and makes her an outsider. She does not see nature as being something which has been given to her by God and therefore she has dominion over it. She sees herself as intrinsically part of it. She is also natural. So these were sort of the ideas that I was playing with when I was coming up with her character. I was interested in giving her something which brings her deep pleasure but also marks her out as separate from the people in the community that she lives with. And it's also a way eventually that she ends up, I guess, forming such a close relationship with initially a friendship with Taya because Taya sees in this ability, you know, um, I guess even if she doesn't experience it, experience it as herself, she accepts and acknowledges the joy that it brings Hannah rather than thinking it a bit odd like mm. the rest of her family do. Yeah. So that brings me to the question of writing voice. So how does voice come to you? And I'd love to sort of go into both um, Hannah and Taya because they're both young girls, they're the same age, similar backgrounds, and yet they're very different. And because we're sort of interested in that sort of process and craft aspect, how do you find those voices and how does that then translate to the page? For you? Mm, that's a good question. Yeah, voice is so crucial for me. I can't start writing anything in a book unless I've got voice down. So, you know, I write my way into it, basically. 
I was really struggling to come up with a voice for Hannah. I'd already decided I wanted to write a book in first person. I thought it would suit the, the subjects that I was interested in. Um, so that was all I had. I knew it was a first person voice of a young girl. But I I wanted to to encapsulate so much within her voice, largely, you know, this kind of um a kind of elevated language, a language that spoke to the divine that would speak and honour the sort of love story that I was trying to tell. So I knew that it would be lyrical, but I was having trouble finding consistency in it in that early sort of writing. So I started doing what I often do around there, which is take long walks and then come <laughs> back and do a lot of just just free writing, you know. So I'm not, I'm not trying to edit what I'm doing. I'm not trying to censor it. I just let it kind of sort of come out. And after enough time, I find little things in there which seem to sort of hold some sort of promise. And what I ended up doing was I came back and I was just sitting in front of my computer, you know, the sort of <laughs> proverbial blank screen thinking, oh, Hannah, just write something, just write anything. And I sat down and I wrote this little, this little paragraph. And as soon as I finished it, I thought, that's it, all of it. That is just the voice. And that little paragraph I thought wouldn't even be in the book, but I sort of pasted it into a notebook and that became kind of my touchstone or my anchor for every time that I forgot what, you know, I kind of lost my way in terms of character voice or the voice of the book, which is carried by Hannah's, Hannah's voice. I returned to that paragraph and I read it. I thought, okay, yes, that's it. So, you know, in terms of heat seeking, it was, it was white hot, you know, yeah. and even though I decided early on, I thought it wouldn't be in the book. It's actually the first first paragraph in the book. Oh, so it's, it's the first paragraph. Section. Oh, should yeah, we read I it? Couldn't. Let's read it. <laughs> so it's the very first thing a reader will find when they open it up. And it's and it's Hannah and it's just has that same sort of raw, I guess, aspect of feeling. Um, so it's, Taya, there is no line in your palm I have not traced, no knuckle cracked unheard, and the blue of your eyes is the coffin lining of the world. I would they sing psalms to you and the down upon your thighs and the eyelashes that have fallen to the fields you have worked. I would they lay boughs upon knees bent to the soil hum of any place you have rested upon. Tear, if love were a thing, it would be the sinew of a hand stretched in anticipation of grasping. See, my hands, they reach for you. My heart is a hand reaching. Ah, oh, so beautiful. <laughs> so that was, that was my little go-to whenever I had to be reminded about the voice and that then fed its way kind of threaded through the rest of the book and then once I had the voice down then that was when you know all the sort of the the structural the big building blocks kind of came to play in terms of the drafting process and then so how were you able to then differentiate Taya's voice it was interesting I think Taya's voice was in so many ways influenced by Hannah's and her character because the way you know it's in first person so everything that is in the book about Taya is has already been fed through Hannah you know she mm -hmm. she talks about the things that she remembers with Taya she recalls dialogue that was important to her she describes her so it's the things that she notices about this character so in some ways we never see Taya you know um, separated from Hannah they are already they are always joined because it's being narrated through those eyes but I always had this um, understanding that whereas Hannah comes from a family who is very strict, very observant, um, very dutiful, quite reticent, not affectionate whatsoever, Taya is the embodiment of her own family, um, which is completely different. So Taya has a mother who is has a has um, a different ethnicity. She's a vend. Um, which is sort of a Slavic minority who exists in Prussia at this time. She's interested in herbalism. She's a midwife. But on top of these things, which sort of mark her, Anna Maria, Taya's mother, is slightly different, her family is, they laugh a lot together. They're physically affectionate with one another. They don't really mind about observing small rules like, you know, etiquette when you're eating because they have, I guess, I guess a greater understanding and, and compassion for human nature, you know, for the fallibilities of being human. Mm -hmm. So Taya, um, Taya's voice and her character then just sort of was the embodiment of this kind of acceptance, um, not tolerance, acceptance mm -hmm. and this compassion and this warmth. I saw her always as as this very sort of warm person. But also with Taya, Taya, it's funny, I um, we talked about all the weird disparate things that you kind of collect like a bowerbird when you're thinking about what to write next. And one of the things I had was a kind of a, it's kind of sounds so woo-woo, it's not woo-woo, but I just had a sort of vision. I had this sort of idea in my mind's eye or this sort of, I don't know, tableau of a, a girl, a teenage sort of age woman um, in a field 
with very sort of very pale blonde hair and she was sort of smiling to herself and she was walking through this field but most significantly she was being observed by someone who adored her and it was that so even from the very beginning everything about Taya was also a representation of Hannah's character mm. so um so yeah that's kind of where it came on I had this very strong I had a very strong visual sense of Taya always of how she was and her little gestures and demeanors um and and yeah, those were the things that I lent on in terms of forming her character. But it was also, whenever I became uncertain as to how to portray her, it, I just had to go back to Hannah because I mean, they're so they're so entwined. You know, what what me- would make her special? What sort of person would Hannah be drawn to? Um, what memories would she carry throughout her life of Taya? That was the sort of thing that I could always fall back on. But yeah, I imagined her as this sort of very very warm person who is a very gentle presence in in Hannah's life and that's shown really beautifully I think too in that scene where Hannah is just over at Taya's place for dinner where she sees Taya's parents touching um, which her parents don't do Mm -hmm. Um, Hannah is a twin her twin Mateus he's she's not allowed to sleep with him anymore because that's frowned upon even though she and she just craves that human touch doesn't she and Mm -hmm. She's having dinner and the parents are sort of hold hands or touch hands and they're laughing and then Taya throws her arm around Hannah and she just leans into it and you can just feel that that need in her for that human touch because she just doesn't have it in her life. So that yeah. really, I think, highlights the sort of difference between them two. It's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mm. And it's, you know, that's like I say, you know, what would be so significant to Hannah in Taya and physical affection was immediately one of those yeah. things. And that then related back to what I'd already established in terms of my understanding of Hannah as being someone who actually is quite a sensual person. You know, she has a very yeah. sort of sense, you know, an elevated sort of sensual experience of the natural world and yet she's at this home where she, no one touches each other. And it's so interesting. Since the book has come out, I've met readers who have said, I grew up in a family like that. You know, my father hugged me for the first time when I was 25 and that was only because I hugged him. It was on my birthday. As you know, these families existed and that was drawn from research too. I would come across these accounts of, you know, they had 20 children, but, you know, no one ever saw them touching each other. I mean, of course they must have, but but no one ever saw it. It (laughs) Behind closed doors. (laughs) Uh, but, you know, it was so, it just seemed, I grew up in a family who was super touchy-feely, you know. Same. We basically, if we're talking to, you know, it's, <laughs> and I've, and I kind of can't compute when I've been in situations where, you know, people aren't willing to have hugs and things. And of course I respect that, but it's, um yeah, it was just a very different experience. So I was, in some ways, I guess I was also drawing on my own, my own background of having a family who is, you know, incredibly close and, yeah. and very physically affectionate. You're probably like our family when you go to say goodbye to the whole family at an event. It You generally have to start half an hour before you want to leave oh, because yeah. you have to go You've around and kiss it. and hug everybody. <laughs> it's true. And you might have to do it again if you yeah. miss someone and people catch you on the way out again. Yeah, exactly. Totally. Yeah. Exactly. The structure is so interesting to me and it just works so beautifully. The book is set into three days, essentially. The first day, the second day, the third day. Slight biblical reference there. <laughs> um <laughs> subtitled before after then and then there's a little section at the end now so it's sort of these four sections knowing what I know now that you're not a plotter perhaps the structure (laughs) came later yeah that was one of the latest things in terms of the drafting process I knew quite early on um when I was sort of writing my way into it and finding character the voice that I was hearing from Hannah felt adult it felt mature and so I knew that the story would be it was sort of being told. I had this strong sense that she was telling someone this story sort of of her life. So the voice didn't have to, you know, it wasn't, there's, even though there's many sections where she's young, it, she's, she's telling those stories from the perspective of being a grown woman. So that was very clear to me. And I knew that somewhere along the line, I would have to kind of work out what I was doing structurally in order for that to happen. Um, but that didn't actually work out until I made a decision, <laughs> which happens in the middle of the book. And you'll know what I'm talking about. Yes. And I can't really say what it is because it's no. a huge spoiler. But this was something that wasn't originally planned from the start. It was something that, although looking back, was kind of inevitable. I um, I decided to write a love story and I was struggling to write a love story that did not somehow incorporate shame. 
I was adamant that I didn't want to write a narrative of shame. So I didn't want to write a love story, for example, where one of the characters was perhaps aware of their feelings, but they were didn't know if the other one did, so they didn't know if they were reciprocated and they were aware that these feelings were, according to the social mores at the time, you know, uh, you know, bad, and so that they they you know brought that felt they shamed themselves. I didn't want have to have a relationship in secrecy where eventually they, you know, because you need you need a narrative structure in there somewhere um, where they would be found out and shamed. And I also didn't want to have a narrative where in order to live without shame, they would have to be removed from the society that they grew up in. So, you know, a, a, a story of exodus. I didn't want any of those things. I think, which is hard because from a historical perspective, those are what would be most likely. Yeah. So, and also, I guess, from a narrative perspective as well, because, you know, conflict, yeah. tension, ta, 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 you know, all the things that, exactly. you know, you're supposed to have in there. Yeah. Totally. I mean, but I mean, just in, but even just honouring the historical period, I mean, it was, you just could never have really a, a love story between, I, mean, I was thinking no, yeah. probably the closest I'm going to get is having two women who remain sort of spinsters and somehow have the good fortune to own property, which is unlikely again, <laughs> yeah. um, and live together as sort of amicable sort of besties. Friends. Or, uh, you, know, you know, it's so problematic and it mm. also, yeah, it just doesn't work as, no. as a novel. So I was thinking to myself, what can I do? What can I do to sort of write, a, like maintain this historical time and be true to that and to honour that, yet at the same time have a love story where my characters are completely aware of the way that they feel about one another and also feel no shame about it and are also not shamed by others. And that was when I made the decision to kind of break with my with you know what can I say maybe realist tendencies to kind of go completely off track and in many ways kind of drop the reader off a cliff um but as soon as I thought of that solution I knew I had to do it because it also solved another problem that I was encountering which was writing about Australia's colonial past in a way that did not seek to celebrate it so I thought if I can basically do some imaginative trickery here then I can essentially write a modern queer love story and I can also write about our colonial past with a contemporary understanding of just how, you know, terrible colonialism is. Um, and so that's why I made that structural decision. And as soon as, or that, I guess, decision in terms of plot and that then, as soon as I did that and I sort of finished writing it out in the next draft I went through and that structure, you know, before, after, then, now, it was was there. It was like a gift, you know, just because of the other decisions, other creative decisions I had made, yeah. and what was already in the draft in terms of, like you said, the religious references to three days yeah. and the significance of that. So yeah, that was sort of how it all happened. But it was some things kind of arrive and they so they fit so neatly that you wonder whether you hadn't been thinking it all along. Yeah. But I think that would be sort of. <laughs> giving myself undue credit. I think sometimes <laughs> things just kind of do fall into your lap because of other decisions that you've already made. Wow, what a solution, Hannah. Brave, so brave. Yeah, it was a scary thing to do. And I know that we can't really talk about it. No, but I just I, I couldn't see can't. another way around it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what? We can't talk about it because it... A, it's a spoiler, but mm. B, it's something that people just need to discover in the reading because mm. I... I think I said to you in my my notes to you earlier, I had to read it and reread it just to make sure that what I'd read was what I'd read. And then I read it again just for the beauty of the, the writing and the way you had done it. And it's just beautiful and perfect. I loved it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was tricky. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about it later because um, it was just gorgeous. So talk, talk to me about these little vignettes. Is that something that comes to you? Was it, was it a function of breastfeeding as well? You know, where you just go, right, I've got like 10 minutes before another feed is due. Or is that just the way that you prefer to write and the way it came to you? I think it's a little bit of both, to be honest. Um, I know, I mean, with my other two books, I didn't write them in a linear form at all. I would, I tend to write sections I once, um, when I was writing burial rights, it was as part of a PhD, which I haven't completed, but um, uh, my supervisor at the time, I was sort of saying, oh, I just don't know what to write in this chapter. And she's like, well, just leave it. Write something you want to write. Write something that you already do see in your mind. And so that's how I write. I write what I can already like visualise, basically. I'm a very visual writer. I need to be able to sort of, it's like, you know, being on stage. I need to kind of walk my way through the set, see everything that's there, hear the characters, and then I can, then I can write it. 
And so because of that, I tend, you know, it's very rare that I'll write things in sequential order. I'll write the scenes that speak to me and then that will feed, you know, I guess my inspiration for other scenes. And then I sort of have all this again completely, just basically, if it was paper, it would be entirely chaotic. And there are, have been times where I've just completely lined you know, the floor or wall of a room with all these various pieces. Yeah. I used to work with a massive binder folder and kind of chuck whatever I'd written in more or less where I thought it would go. You know, maybe this will be somewhere in the middle or this is, to, you know, this is the end or this will be happening before that. And eventually by the time I had a first draft, I kind of, you could kind of see, it was like a really inept paleontologist trying to kind of recreate a dinosaur that you have no idea what it's going to end up looking like anyway that's a terrible analogy but um <laughs> but yeah so it works <laughs> I'm not sure I'd scrap that out of the novel let's do take that but, um, <laughs> but basically that's kind of how I would operate and then because I was you know because I'm not very technologically advanced I would just work with word as software and then I found, though, with this book, I was writing shorter pieces of writing. So it would just be like a little bit of dialogue or a little scene. It was probably just like the equivalent of one page at a time. Um, also because I was tired, also because my working day was much more fractured and at different times than what it normally was. And so I just couldn't keep track of it all. So that was when I switched to Scrivener as a, as a software interface because you can have that sort of left menu bar where you very easily can click and drag. So you're not copy pasting and losing half of it like I was with Word. And that and once I sort of worked my way around Scrivener, I thought, oh, this is fantastic. This is the easiest way for yeah. me to do it. Um, so, yeah, I very much just wrote, wrote it in tiny little sections um, I used to walk around the, the hills with the, you know, kids and babies and prams with Heidi. And we would, I did a lot of the writing of this book by talking to her about it, actually, just having these conversations and saying, what about this? Would this be interesting, you know, as we were walking around trying to get these babes to sleep? And um, she'd be like, yeah, that sounds great. And then I'd come back and I'd just even write notes sometimes. So they wouldn't even be fully fleshed seeds. It would just be like little grabs here and there. So it was, that was probably one of the reasons why you know it took me so long it was just trying to sort of it was not a cohesive process nowhere near like my other novels mm -hmm. which even though they were non-linear was still kind of contained this was a weird sprawling chaotic process but yeah the, at least the interface the script and made me think that I was doing something sensible I guess you'll never go back to word after oh, God, that no. it's uh, pretty life-changing yeah, isn't it amazing. yeah it's really really yeah. good do you find people become quite evangelical about it and then you've got the people in the word camp who are like no yeah. I will never go to Scrivener I don't like it <laughs> I tried it before I, I mean, you know I tried it with my yeah. other novel and I just couldn't I just felt uncomfortable it felt too it was distracting me mm. from the writing process but I think I was so distracted you know in the years that I was writing devotion anyway by just a myriad other life things um that I that it actually worked really well because I could just very quickly remind myself of what I'd already written I think just like books, some books come into your life and you're not ready for them and they might sit on your shelf for five years and then you pick it up and say, oh, my God, this is the best novel ever. Why did it, it take me so long to read it? That's Scrivener, I yeah, think. Totally. It has to come to you at it's the right true, time. But, you know, I'm a very firm believer that, you know, with every book, you're still a debut writer. You know, no, you don't know how to write. I feel like I just don't still don't know how to write books because you're always learning a new way to fit the kind of book that you're trying to write at the time. So for me, every book is like mm. a first book. I don't feel like having written previous ones gives you any hints or tips. So I might go back to Word. Who knows? <laughs> I might write one by hand one day if it calls for it. But, um, yeah, I think every every novel demands its own methodology and its own equipment, its own sort of hours and approach. And, yeah, devotion was <laughs> I was crazy. <laughs> it, was, it was my hardest <laughs> one yet and it was very, very fractured. But I think it, I think it, couldn't have been written any other way, to be honest. Well, somehow those dinosaur bones all fit together <laughs> and created a pretty damn beautiful dinosaur, <laughs> Hannah. Um, so with those short vignettes, I, I guess that's why you also had so many drafts because you were constantly having to put all these pieces together. Did you find that you had to structure the, the vignettes themselves to say, right, well, this needs a bit more conflict in it or it needs more tension or... Um, I need to create some kind of curiosity here. How did that work in the editing process? Yeah, definitely. That probably came once all those little bits and pieces, those little scraps of paper and disparate mm -hmm. vignettes had more or less been pulled together in order. And then it's sort of, it was a matter then of having some time away from it and trying to sort of, I guess, 
fake having fresh eyes because you can never read your own work with fresh eyes, right? right? You always know what's what's going on. Um, but to try and sort of try and replicate that process and then coming through and seeing what's working. And that's really the point when I have all those tiny bits of rhyming kind of lined up, more or less the, the dinosaur points where I know they ought to go, that's when I go through and I start to sort of flesh the bones, I guess, with um with pace and with tension and structure so that's when things move away from I guess the emotional to something which is a little bit more objective so my first drafting you know when you're getting character and voice I find it an emotional process it's about trying to find the sort of the grand themes of the book it's trying to for in the case of devotion it was about trying to nail a love story and my characters and how they felt there was so much feeling in this book and then when it so every, all of that was sort of there and voice was there and character was there and I was I was confident in those elements. Then it was a matter then of, you know, going through it, making sure that everything flowed smoothly, that the pace was tight, finding any pieces which were baggy or any work which was, even though I might have liked it and it suited character or it suited voice, was completely superfluous to the purpose of the narrative. So that was when sort of characters, you know, the creation of characterization takes a step back and the narrative as a, you know, the book as a whole as a as a as a novel that's going to sustain interest that's when that really comes up but yeah usually by that stage i have what you you know a printout the equivalent of a, of a sort of a first draft and that's a matter then of making sure that everything you know is is working from a from an objective perspective yeah so effectively you're putting on your craft hat and saying yeah this description is too long, where can I make those cuts? Yeah, this, okay. In terms of pace, so pacing is really important for you. I got that feeling as I was reading and just going back and trying to analyse that, I couldn't really do it, but all I could <laughs> sort of uh, glean was really just writing in these short vignettes and just keeping that dialogue punching, the really good balance between scene and summary. Um, you never bog us down in huge amounts of backstory it's all woven in beautifully thank you that's so love that's so lovely to hear yeah when I write I when I, I cut a lot of stuff I tend to overwrite and I cut it out and I'm so yeah yeah and I feel so badly about cutting out stuff that I like you know the proverbial kill your darlings mm. but I have a separate little document where I copy and paste all the things I've cut with Just the hope case. <laughs> with the hope that I might be able to sneak them back in and look I, you never do because it's always you know in the end it is about you know character and plot and how they feed off each other and you realize that it's just not serving the novel it's it might be beautiful it might be interesting but it doesn't work and I think you know maybe this is the one thing that having written more books now I feel like I can trust that process um which is to to research and to not and to not research while I'm writing a book because that's how you get that sort of extraneous kind of historical interesting historical stuff which doesn't serve character and therefore doesn't serve plot so for me that's probably I, I really yeah have learned that you've got to if it's if it's going to cut it's not going back in you've really got to try and make it as lean as possible and it's also I think a way to you know for me I, I wanted this book to have a lyrical quality and you can crowd a book with too much you know I think you need to strip back so much to let what is essential to the book really shine so that was and that you know therefore has an ongoing sort of effect to pace too it's hard it's you can't really ever isolate I find one single element because they all intertwine but it's a matter for me of just going through and kind of being ruthless and yeah very much being um, an editor to form for myself well as a person who founded a magazine called Kill Your Darlings, I would expect nothing less than a good <laughs> darling killings. Oh, uh, you know what they say. The first advice you give is the one you need to take yourself. So, yeah, that's definitely true for me. I, I always say it's the plumber with the leaky tap. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly right. Hannah, can you take us through some of the editorial process for devotion in terms of working with an editor? Like at what point do you hand it over to somebody else to, to bring those fresh eyes to the project? It's a good question. I think um, generally I feel it's when I know that there's still a whole bunch of problems, I've, I can't come up with solutions. So often, you know, drafting process, you see what's wrong, you sit in it for a while, you go for a walk, you have a little bit of a sulk, and then you work out what to do and you can fix it. And I feel like the time to bring a fresh eyes in is when you just cannot... You know that it's flawed, you know that there's work to do, but you're just so close. You just lack that necessary distance. And so that's when you call in sort of the support team. And sometimes that's not an editor. Sometimes that's just a, a trusted reader. Um, mm. Sometimes it is an editor because they, you know, will give you the hard truth that a friend might not. Um, <laughs> but I, um, with this book, it was actually much more about also 
um, hitting deadlines. So I I had promised the book by a certain day and I needed to, li- to deliver it then. And I felt had I sort of, you know, had the luxury of time, I would have probably held on to it for probably too long, probably for long enough that it actually wouldn't have made a difference because mm. I was still going to do the work anyway. But I, but I would say that my editor was involved a little bit earlier than I would normally have liked with this book where I probably could have found out some solution. But then we, I had the very lovely pleasure of being able to discuss those solutions and probably hit upon them a little faster. So that's not being directed by an editor. It's just having someone to have those conversations with. It's basically hearing yourself talk out loud. So for me, the editorial process that works best for the way that I work is I very much do not like to be told what to do. And in my experience, editors very rarely do that anyway. It's they just ask questions, you know, they ask questions that you realise you've already been asking yourself and you realise you you are allowed to have a kind of a gut response to what they what they ask and you're like, oh yeah, no, that's Every time I've ever worked in the capacity of an editor too, when you have these conversations, writers are like, yeah, no, you're right, you're right. I know, I know. They're already, they've already been there. So it was just having that conversation a little bit sooner. So I probably would have liked to do one more sort of draft run through, but that's also, I like to hold on to my work for as long as I can because I get very anxious about people reading it. So, yeah. but yeah, no, it was, a, it was a very much a process of having just conversations, not even receiving notes. It was just mm-hmm. the first things were just talking about character, talking about you're just kind of hearing the questions and my editor had in terms of, you know, why did they do this? And you think, okay, that's not, that's not clear. And so you work on clarity for that Mm. aspect of the story. But then I like to sort of have a little, you know, kind of a little flurry of these conversations with my agent too. And then I like to shut out the noise and run away and try to work out how to fix it all. Kind of get that, I guess, the little zap of energy from those conversations, a little bit of motivation and then send it back. And so, and by that stage, I'd, I've never done such an intensive edit and rewrite on a book between the draft that's first handed up and the consequent draft. So my structural edit, um, I had, I, I, man, I wrote like an additional forty thousand words. I completely upended it. I did made massive structural changes, massive chunks cut out. It was like writing the book from scratch all over again. But it, and it was hard. I was working seven days a week. You know, my partner had the kids, so I could just get it done. I was working up until midnight. I've, you know, I was working knowing that I would never work that, have to work that out again. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was really proud of the work that I did do, and I felt like by the time I handed it up, that it was you know mm. so much better, so much stronger. Were there any standout additions or deletions or things that you had to change that you can think of in relation to devotion the ending changed so it was now it's much more i think it's a much better i think it was the ending which is now in the book was inevitable for the story and the characters and everything that had been set up but i had sort of fumbled fumbled the ball right at the end when I handed it up and my editor basically said so in so many words being like the ending doesn't really fit with what you've established and as soon as that sort of happened I was like right yeah okay got more work to do so yeah it was um but yeah I really love that I mean it's always a privilege to have an editor it's a privilege that anyone will read your work and take the time to offer you feedback or to to really engage with the characters and the story on the level that they have you know that they're invested and they ask those kinds of questions but yeah to me that's the best kind of relationship with an editor it's one which is conversational and largely you know just question based yeah yeah what was the biggest challenge of writing devotion and how did you overcome it the biggest writing of devotion was definitely the fatigue I felt writing it. Um, my firstborn was a very bad sleeper. And then as anyone knows, just little baby keeps you up a lot. I've never, um, you know, my children are now two and four. And I feel like finally now that the book is out, they've decided to sleep through the night. But the process of Excellent. writing it, you know, I was, I was not getting that much sleep, you know, I, I hate to be just a, a whinging parent, but I mean, any parent <laughs> knows what it's like. You just, you're so unprepared for that level of, of just tiredness and brain fog. So, you know, writing this book through that kind of brain fog um, was massively challenging. I have drunk so much coffee. And also I think that's probably why the process took that little bit longer because it just, it, you know, I was a lot slower and my brain just wasn't firing as it normally did. Um, so I think that was the biggest challenge was trying to mm. kind of hold you know, you're trying to hold like a 120,000 word document in your brain while you're just like covered in vomit and, you know, <laughs> milk. It's just, 
and so tired. You know, you've had three hours the night before. I mean, that was what I found so challenging. And yet at the same time, I am super aware of the fact that I was hugely privileged in the fact that my partner could take time off work so I could even write in the first place. You know, mm-hmm. I think what, I mean, what a gift. That's just yeah. extraordinary, that kind of sacrifice. So, you know, it's, it feels very much like, you know, all oh, these diamonds are really heavy. But, um, you know, that was, if I have to be totally honest, that's what it was. It was just being yeah. so tired. Were you able to pull any of that into the writing? Because there is childbirth in this. Mm-hmm. There is raising of small children. There is um, looking after small children on creaky, leaky, vomity boats um, <laughs> <laughs> in the 19th century. Um, were you able to bring any of those experiences in or were you aware of it even it's funny you know no I don't think it made any difference because I mean I'd written about children in my previous two novels and I think that you know I don't I don't believe that you need to for instance experience being a parent to write about parenthood um or to write about children I mean there's lots of other ways that you can work it out for yourself or you know the empathic or observational of other people's experiences I think what the fatigue and the parenthood (laughs) did for me was made me care less about what people might think. So it gave me oh. greater conviction in what I had to do because I couldn't waste my time. For instance, in the big sort of twist in the middle, I was so tired. I was just thinking, oh, just, I'm just going to do it. Like, I don't even care anymore. You know, you just kind <laughs> of reprioritize everything. Um, so I think that's probably what it did. And it also made me, yeah, less concerned about how people might respond to something like that. And it made me more decisive in my... I guess, choice to write a book that I wanted to read. So I think that was probably what it did in some sort of weird, indirect way. Mm. Yeah. Hannah, is there anything else you think would be useful to other writers? The only thing I can ever, ever say is what I try to tell myself when I'm in the thick of it, and that is just to keep showing up. I think I think that counts for so much more than anything. Talent, you know, craft, you just got to keep showing up and keep persisting, keep working at it, and, you know, faith in the process. Because uh, I, I feel like I have been quite open throughout my career so far about the self-doubt that really accompanies my creativity. And the only way that I can sort of make room for that and continue working is to trust in the process. So that is, yeah, just showing up to the desk as often as you can and having faith that even though what is on the screen or on the page doesn't resemble this sort of amazing thing you had envisioned at the start, that with enough writing and rewriting and drafting and time, you know, you get as close to it as possible. So this is what I tell myself, is just to keep going, basically. Just keep going. Yeah. Every book I think, I'm I'm not going to be able to finish this book, and every time I do. So now I just think this is all these thoughts are just a natural part of the process. Just, Just show up. Just keep showing yeah. up. Yeah, that's great advice. And are you showing up anytime soon for some more novel writing? What's going on for you right now? Oh, it's kind of COVID dependent, to be honest, yeah. because I have some more historical fiction in mind, but it will require travel. So it's when I'm free to do that and able to do that. Um, I also have, I've been really enjoying uh, sort of these early forays into screenwriting. So Run, Rabbit, Run was a feature film that I wrote. It's a psychological horror film. I wrote it when I was very morning sick, um, which I think accounts for the dark genre. But it's uh, <laughs> it was just shot, actually. They're, they're rap shooting, so now it's in pre-production. So that's been really exciting. So I'm looking oh, forward to Oh, that is maybe... exciting. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it's directed by Dana Reed and starring Sarah Snook from Succession. Um, I love her. She's wonderful. She's, and she's amazing in this, what I saw of it. Um, so, yeah, so that's been really great. So I'm hoping to maybe do a little bit more screenwriting in the future. Um, but, yeah, also just, you know, there was something so liberating and devotion about just doing something completely different creatively and to kind of, you know, moving out of the corner that perhaps I was feeling I was painting myself into. So Mm -hmm. I'm maybe a contemporary novel, who knows, maybe nonfiction. I'm not sure. Everything's (laughs) open. I haven't started any of these projects, so I'm very excited about all of them. As soon as I start, I'll think, no, this is a terrible idea. (laughs) Maybe you have to have another baby so you can just have that devil may care attitude again. We done. We done. It's either going to be a book or a baby, and this time I'm choosing a book, I think. (laughs) Yeah, you know, when you're done, you're done, right? That's it. That's it. (laughs) Hannah, it's been absolutely delightful speaking with you. Thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to chat with me today. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. It's it's so lovely to be able to, to come on here and speak with you. Thank you. 
I really hope you enjoyed that chat with Hannah as much as I did. I'm so excited to see her film, Run Rabbit Run, later this year. Listen to the premise. Sarah Snook plays a fertility doctor who believes firmly in life and death, but after noticing the strange behaviour of her young daughter, must challenge her own values and confront a ghost from her past. Doesn't that sound fabulous? You can find out more about the film and all of Hannah's books at her website, hannahkentauthor.com. And you'll find links to all her social media accounts there too. Now, I have another really terrific guest for you coming up this month, the wonderful Tony Jordan. Tony is another writer of many varied talents. Her novels span drama, comedy, historical, but no matter what she writes, you always know you're in the capable hands of a very assured and experienced writer. I've heard Tony talk about the importance of separating two of the key elements of writing, the creative and the analytical, so I'm very much looking forward to chatting with her about that. Now, with her latest novel, Dinner with the Schnabels, Tony is heading back into the realm of family comedy. Things haven't gone well for Simon Larson lately. He adores his wife Tansy and his children, but since his business failed and he lost the family home, he can't seem to get off the couch. Simon is permanently unemployed and permanently unshaven. His larger-than-life in-laws, the Schnabels, Tansy's mother, sister and brother, won't get off his case. To keep everyone happy, Simon needs to do one little job. He has a week to landscape a friend's backyard for an important Schnabel family event. But as the week progresses, Simon is derailed by the arrival of an unexpected house guest. Then he discovers Tansy is harbouring a secret. As his world spins out of control, who can Simon really count on when the chips are down? That's the premise of the novel. Sounds great, doesn't it? Tony wrote this novel to put a smile on her face, and it definitely put one on mine too. This was, for me, a perfect post-pandemic read, and actually one of the first novels I've read that references the pandemic, not in a medical way, but more in terms of the impact it had on poor old Simon's career and his mental health. Dinner with the Schnabels is out now, and as always, you can buy a copy in all the usual places. Or you can try and win a copy. Thanks to Tony's fabulous publisher, Hachette, uh, they have offered one copy for me to give away. So just head over to my Instagram or Facebook where you'll find instructions on how to enter. Entries will close on April the 9th. But of course, if you're listening to this podcast in the future, there's a new giveaway every month. So just keep an eye on the Writers Book Club socials or sign up to my newsletter at michellebarraclough.com. This month, all my newsletter subscribers will also go in the draw to win a copy of another new release, So Many Beats of the Heart by Carrie Cox, with thanks to her publisher, Affirm Press. I'll pop a post about that book in my socials as well, so check that out and make sure you sign up uh, to my newsletter if you want to go in the draw for that as well. Okay, I think that's it for this month. As always, I recorded today's episode on the beautiful unceded lands of the Garigal people of the Eora Nation. Hannah Kent was speaking with us from the land where she lives and works on Paramount Country near Adelaide in South Australia. Thanks so much for listening and I'll catch you next month. Until then, happy writing.